I'm pleased to welcome you all uh, to this IIEA webinar today, and we are delighted to be joined by Kevin Rodd, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Asian Society. And Kevin has been very generous and has taken time out of his schedule to speak to us. Um, Mr. Rudd will speak to us for about five or 10 minutes, and then he and I will move into a discussion followed by a question and answer with our audience, all of which is on the record. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once we come to the Q&A. And could I ask you to identify yourselves and your affiliations uh, in opposing the questions? <clears throat> Let me also just briefly remind everybody that throughout this month, the IIEA is celebrating 30 years since it was founded. And the inaugural Brendan Halligan lecture by the Taoiseach, Michal Martin, will take place next Monday, May the 17th. And for more details on the full program, uh, visit uh, the website iiea.com. And please also feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag IIEA30. Uh, I will now briefly introduce Kevin Rod and hand over to him. Kevin became president and CEO of the Asia Society in January 2021 and has been president of the Asia Society Policy Institute since January 2015. He served as Australia's 26th Prime Minister from 2007 to 2010, then as Foreign Minister from 2010 to 2012, before returning as Prime Minister of Australia in 2013. He is a senior fellow at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government, a distinguished fellow at Chatham House in London, a distinguished statesman with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC, and a distinguished fellow at the Paulson Institute in Chicago. I also want to underline that Kevin Rod has an extraordinary depth and breadth of knowledge about China, its people, its politics and policies, its language, its culture, and its history. And I can think of no one better able to present and situate for us today the rise of China as a global geopolitical power. Kevin, uh, could I invite you to take the floor? Well, thank you very much, uh, Declan, and uh, greetings from Australia, where it's uh, evening but good to join you in the Irish Republic where it's morning. And to all of uh, our and my good friends in Dublin and in the Irish Foreign Service abroad, uh, if you can sense from my name, um, uh, being a Kevin, uh, my mother's ancestry is, uh, is Irish, uh, Ballangarry, County Tipperary. Uh, my father, as you can see from my surname was English, uh, but my mother's family were free settlers, uh, whereas my father's family were all 100% criminal convicts. So the Irish brought, shall we say, a degree of civilization to the Union. Let me talk about um, the question we've been set uh, for uh, this discussion, which is about uh, the impact of China on global geopolitics. Uh, Declan, let me spend um, five or 10 minutes sketching out the world as seen through the lens of uh, Beijing itself because uh, we can go in our discussion uh, between yourself and myself and through the Q&A as to what that means for the rest of us. But I've always had a view that the beginning of wisdom in understanding China's uh, actions in the world is to understand China's worldview as seen from Beijing. Um, and here are a number of core points. People often ask me what's uh, Xi Jinping's uh, core priority. Number one core priority for Xi Jinping, you'll be surprised to learn, is to stay in power uh, and for the Communist Party to stay in power. Not seeing the Communist Party as a transitional political arrangement to some uh, more benign form of democratic governance longer term, but to remain in power. Number two, Xi Jinping's um, priority is to maintain the unity of what they describe as the motherland. Um, hence, the intensity, the extremity of Chinese policies adopted in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and its absolute, almost ideological, some would say religious determination to see the return of Taiwan to Chinese sovereignty. Number three, if you look at these as concentric circles of interest, is um, China's um, determination through the Communist Party leadership to continue to grow the Chinese economy in aggregate size, uh, 
as well as to increase Chinese living standards to the point of it becoming a fully developed, not just middle income country. And that explains the last 35 years of sustained economic reform under Deng, uh, but a reform policy which has undergone some qualification in the most recent several years under Xi Jinping as the party turns somewhat to the left on politics and the economy. Number four in this uh, concentric set of circles of interest is a new agenda, a new priority for the party, which is environmental sustainability. Not because the Communist Party in their heart of heart through a bunch of suppressed greenies. No. It's because um, sustainability, climate change, and frankly, air pollution have emerged as mainstream political pressures on the party from the Chinese people, particularly in urban China, uh, given the hell for leather approach uh, to industrialization of the previous 35 years. Hence why China is gravitating in a more positive direction on climate change, the interreaction between hydrocarbon pollution at home, uh, particular matter pollution, plus uh, more broadly, the correlation with that, and of course, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and carbon in particular. Number five is the modernization of the Chinese military. Um, Xi Jinping's aspiration is for the Chinese armed forces to become a war winning and war fighting uh, capability, uh, a thoroughly modernized People's Liberation Army by the specified completion date of the modernization process by 2027. Six, in terms of China's geostrategic circumstances, it wishes to push the United States back uh, from the Western Pacific and East Asia, perhaps as far as Guam, uh, in order to uh, make China's immediate Pacific maritime periphery a more benign zone for China's overall strategic interests. Uh, China, geostrategically, has a very deep memory going back to the days of the Opium Wars in the 1840s, uh, and therefore sees its Pacific approaches as a particular corridor of vulnerability for itself, whether it was from the imperial powers of Europe, more recently Japan, and currently the United States. Number seven in this uh, list of priorities is China looking westwards across its continental periphery and seeking through the Belt and Road Initiative and related initiatives to turn that wider expanse uh, into a zone not just of uh, economic opportunity for China, but also a benign foreign policy and political environment for China as well. Initially targeted on Central Asia, now wider Eurasia to Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and in time, Western Europe, uh, as China seeks to turn the maritime Silk Road and the terrestrial Silk Road into corridors of economic opportunity, infrastructure development, and the evolution of a new digital commerce environment driven and dominated by China's new technologies, uh, particularly those of uh, 5G, but more broadly those associated with uh, the, a, a new Chinese regulated internet regime as well. Um, in the last couple of priorities, and I'll conclude on these, uh, looking to uh, other theaters beyond, uh, for example, in Latin America and in Africa and the Middle East, China, again, through its global diplomacy, seeks to use the gravitational pull of its, um, of its uh, economy, becoming the largest either investors or trading partners of the countries uh, of the wider developing world in order not just to, again, expand the Chinese economic footprint, expand Chinese economic uh, markets, extend trade and investment markets, extend its digital commerce market into the future, uh, but also in doing so, create a new foreign policy constituency in those countries so that when there are, for example, resolutions before multilateral institutions, which may otherwise be damaging to China's interests, there is an automatic capacity to harvest votes multilaterally in support of China's interests. Which brings me to the final point in this, uh, if you like, a foreign policy equivalent or a political equivalent of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is starting from the center and moving out, uh, the last uh, one should be seen as China's desire over time to construct an international rules-based order, which is much more accommodating uh, 
of Chinese interests and values than the one that was necessarily framed in 1944 and 45 through the San Francisco Conference and the Bretton Woods Conference. Um, that is not to say that China is in the business of upending these institutions now, no. What China is seeking to do through a series of personnel appointments, a series of resolutions of the United Nations machinery, and through an increasingly activist role in the UN Security Council, um, uh, is in fact to shape a, an international order which no longer challenges Chinese interests and values, but is more accommodating them of, over time, accommodating of them over time. And that is just the beginning of a long-term work in progress. So Declan, that's um, my way of a, a set of framing remarks about a Chinese worldview under Xi Jinping. I'm happy to take the conversation where you'd now like to take it uh, on um, China's behaviors in Europe, uh, in my part of the world in the Indo-Pacific, or where I normally live and work and preside over an American think tank in New York, whatever takes your fancy. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> Thank you for that extremely comprehensive and, and uh, a powerful um, introductory presentation. I'd like to just <clears throat> take up something you said. You referred to, to um, dates. Now, dates are, of course, important in liturgical calendars, and um, the Chinese uh, communist calendar is very liturgical. Um, you mentioned the um, 2027 date for modernization of the military, which is also the 100th anniversary, I think, of the foundation of the People's Liberation Army, um, which is a happy coincidence. Uh, 2021, this year, is the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of China, and also the target date for, as you said, achieving a moderately prosperous all-round society. And 2049, we have the centenary of the People's Republic of China itself. You have referred to the 2020s as the decade of living dangerously. And you've also identified another date, the date of 2035, halfway between now and the centenary, when uh, there will be a general uh, objective of um, China essentially being fully uh, arrived and complete. Could you develop that thought, both the implications for China and also the implications geopolitically and what it means for those other issues you just referred to? Well, thank you, uh, Declan. You're right in your initial observation that uh, dates and timelines uh, mean a lot in the Chinese system. Uh, and, and in terms of the totalizing ideologies of um, Chinese Marxist-Leninism, and the Roman Catholic Church in which I grew up, uh, there are some similarities in terms of the liturgies, both secular and divine. On these um, uh, dates, um, let me put it to you in these terms. The centenary of the party, which is, uh, happens in July of this year, uh, is uh, important in terms of the Communist Party's determination to reassert its political legitimacy domestically, as not just the party which united the country after 100 years of effective division uh, from the 1840s to the 1940s, uh, but secondly, then took this shambolic economy in 1949, this war-torn shambolic economy. And despite all the twists and turns uh, of the um, 60s and 70s, um, by the time we get to uh, the 2020s has grown to be the world's second largest economy, and by the end of this decade, prospectively the largest. So dates are fundamental to the question of political legitimacy so far, and in terms of future political legitimacy, holding uh, holding forth in the tradition almost of uh, Marxist uh, millennialism, um, a view that um, in, by 2049, the centenary of the People's Republic of China, China will emerge as uh, a world great power. We would say it already is. Uh, that's perhaps Chinese code language for describing China then as the world great power. And very much, again, the legitimacy uh, line through that uh, is that only the Chinese Communist Party can achieve this because um, uh, it uniquely is being able to hold the country together uh, and to marshal the critical economic decisions necessary uh, 
to take it from poverty to advanced economy status. I think the final point I'd mention is 2035, which um, again, almost in the um, uh, overwrought nature of Chinese political cosmology uh, is about the midpoint between where we are now uh, and 2049. Uh, but the interesting thing about 2035 is that in the mind's eye of Xi Jinping, that also falls within the possibility of him still being in office. We might say that'll be impossible. He'll be in his uh, early 80s by then, 82, 83. Well, so too might the President of the United States, depending if he seeks a second term or not. Um, but why that is important is that Xi Jinping, being an absolutely determined political leader, a, a leader with a uh, defined uh, vision for where he wishes to take the country and to expand its power and influence in the world, uh, is that um, we are likely to see him in this period of time, the rest of the 20s through to the mid 30s, seeking to force the pace on where perhaps his predecessor leaders were more prepared to allow history to take its course. And that's where we come into the intersection point with Taiwan. Um, and therefore, uh, in Xi Jinping's worldview, I think very much he would wish to see the return of Taiwan to Chinese sovereignty by the time he concludes his term in political office by 2035. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Kevin. Uh, on Xi Jinping, uh, Xi Jinping became general secretary of the Central Committee in 2012 and became president of China 2013. He also uh, took over uh, as president of the Central Military Commission in 2012. How important and how, um, how would you situate the, the galvanizing effect of the change in Chinese approach uh, with the advent to supreme power of Xi Jinping? In other words, were the seeds there already or is this something that's very much uh, a Xi Jinping um, kind of identified uh, development, also given the sort of the emphasis on Xi Jinping, his new thought for socialism and Chinese characteristics, and all the other new tags that have been attached to him. Could you, could you talk a bit about that? Thanks. Yeah, I think um, these two factors um, are mutually reinforcing. One structural and the other derivative of individual leadership politics. The structural factor is this, Chinese behavior in the world today, the assertion and assertiveness of its interests and values, which um, as you and I both know from our earlier diplomatic careers, Declan, no, that was not always the case. The days of, um, of Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese aphorism was, you know, yang hui jue bu dang to, which is hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead has now been yielded to a Chinese phrase again, which is fun fa your way to um, achieve something substantial. Um, and this transition point occurred actually at a meeting of the Central Party Work Conference on Foreign Affairs at the end of 2013, November of that year, where China officially changed its foreign policy doctrine from passive to active. Now, the intersecting point there is structurally, China's ability to uh, assert itself, of course, is a product of China's perception and reality of national power. China as a Marxist Leninist state has an acute consciousness of the balance of power between itself and other countries, most particularly the United States, but also Japan. Um, and therefore, uh, as China's own calculus of its relative military power, economic power, and technological power when measured against the United States and against Japan um, has increased to the point where they see the 2020s, what I have referred to earlier as the decade of living dangerously, as a crossover point, uh, both in terms of relative military capabilities in East Asia and the West Pacific between the Americans and the Chinese, or the Americans and the Japanese and the Chinese, Secondly, economically, in terms of GDP measured as market exchange rates, um, that is a date expected to occur about the end of this decade. And technologically, the great race in terms of, let's call it, uh, superconductors as, uh, sorry, supercomputers, semiconductors, and the race towards artificial intelligence, 
what the outcome there will be vis-a-vis -vis the United States is more difficult to predict. But because of these, um, shall we say, greater convergence of Chinese power with American power, and in some Chinese and American calculus, China now exceeding or prospectively exceeding the United States, that is what shapes the assertiveness we began to see publicly articulated in the events of 2013. But the final part of the ingredient, uh, Declan, is the, the uh, leadership style and personality of Xi Jinping. He's a calculated risk taker, not crazy brave, but calculated risks. Uh, his method of power consolidation within the country is not from the consensual um, uh, textbook of collective leadership. Uh, it's more uh, snatch and grab where you can. Uh, deal with your opponents, eliminate them, purge them, remove them from the party, or otherwise marginalize them. Uh, and when he's seen an opportunity, for example, in the second Obama term, to test the Americans on island reclamation in the South Pacific, he went ahead, uh, sorry, South China Sea, he went ahead and did so, there was no substantive American military reaction. And therefore, from his perspective, this was in fact a risk worth taking. It's this admixture of a structural change in the balance of power between China and the United States and its principal allies on the one hand, plus the particular leadership style of Xi Jinping, which is lead from the front, take calculated risks and accelerate the normal timetable of, shall we say, the evolution of China uh, as his predecessors would have seen as a global great power. Thanks, Kevin. Just, just um, taking up that specific uh, style of Xi leading from the front, um, reform and opening up has been in existence, I suppose, since 1978 and got a boost in 1992. Um, the new notion of dual circulation, the idea that there would be within China a sufficiency of demand to, if you like, compensate for any measures that the West would take against China, how do you see that? Is that simply a hedge? Obviously, it's national self-reliance, which is a very old Chinese principle. But how do you see that uh, meshing with reform and opening up? And do you think it spells the end of the reform and opening up policy? It's an excellent question, which goes to the heart of, let's call it, the next stage of uh, China's economic model. <clears throat> Phase one, I think we're all familiar with. Um, Going back to the time when I was um, first secretary in our embassy in Beijing back in the Mesolithic period, um, and uh, we saw um, the Chinese model then in the 80s and 90s and into the noughties uh, as being labor intensive manufacture for export, paired with high levels of um, state investment in public infrastructure, um, and by and large, uh, generating the phenomenal growth uh, in tandem that we saw. Uh, during those decades, average growth 10, 11% over a 30 year period and compounding, of course, taking an economy which when this began, which was a little smaller than the Australian economy in aggregate size and to becoming the second largest economy in the world. However, back in 2013, just as Xi Jinping came to power, um, the resolution of the party uh, that year uh, was to change the economic model through what was called a major decision of the party centre uh, with some um, 60 uh, separate uh, decisions to accelerate the pace of economic reform further. That is more market-based reforms across the entire economic structure. However, that is not how it's turned out. In 2015, there was a major financial crisis within China itself. Um, when uh, equities markets um, effectively collapsed, created crisis, massive state intervention, uh, creating um, much doubt in terms of the wisdom of, shall we say, unregulated markets, particularly in finance, having absolute sway in what was still politically a Marxist-Leninist system. And then secondly, the impact of the um, US-China trade war of uh, 2019 and 20 no, 2018 and 2019. Um, and, um, and the impact which this had on China's internal conclusion that it could rely on global supply chains to service its own needs, as well as the continued robustness of global export markets, particularly in the, in the age of Trumpian protectionism. Um, 
And then you had, of course, the impact of COVID itself, COVID-19. Putting those factors together, what I have observed is a significant change uh, in the evolution of the growth model away from uh, the reform direction articulated in 2013. And my own think tank, the Asia Policy Institute has tracked this, if any of our participants are interested online, through a series uh, we've called the China Economic Dashboard over the period 2015 to 2020, where it's very difficult to identify a substantive um, significant uh, program of progress across the 10 major categories of economic reform articulated back then. So where are we today? To go to your point about the dual circulation economy. I suspect that uh, what is actually meant by the dual circulation economy is a polite phrase, uh, an interesting phrase, a newly minted phrase to in fact uh, camouflage a much more basic reality which is a trend line pointing in the direction of greater national self-reliance, zili gongsheng, four characters. It's been around, in fact, uh, prior to the reform period of um, 1978, um, uh, but, and even the period of the reform program has still lurked in the background of the Chinese economic discourse, but now gaining a much greater cogency uh, in the debates uh, which have flowed in China since the US-China trade war in particular. And secondly, um, parallel to that, a belief that the yet untapped potential of the Chinese domestic consumption market will be capable of offsetting any net contraction in external demand coming from ever rising, as it were, demand for Chinese goods abroad. Put all that together, what's it mean? I think the dual circulation economy in practice will mean something like this. Yes, we'll continue to trade with the rest of the world, but we, China, mirroring the United States, will begin adjusting our own global supply chains in directions which are more uh, comfortable to us in terms of long, their long-term security and not being held hostage by political, diplomatic or security factors. Um, and on top of that, uh, we will not wish to become economically dependent on anybody external to China in the future, though we're very happy for the rest of the world to become economically dependent on China. That I think is the substantive meaning of the dual circulation economy model, whatever the people's daily might say. <laughs> Thanks, Gavin. I, I just, just one more comment before we uh, go to questions and answers. And it's a very topical point. It's the, um, <clears throat> the question of Chinese population, the census, which as you know, has excited a certain amount of comment in the last few days. Um, <clears throat> Even on Chinese figures, 72 million people were added to the population since 2010. But it's quite clear that um, a decline in population is in the offing. And obviously, this will have implications for age dependency. So the question is um, that I want to ask is, you know, will, to use coin the old phrase, will China get old before it gets rich? And more importantly, in the context of our discussion today, what effect will an aging China have on those geopolitical objectives that you mentioned before, looking forward 10, 20, 30 years? I've um, long argued, Declan, that, um, and again, reinforcing my proposition that the 2020s is the decade of living dangerously, um, is that if we can navigate our way through to 2035 uh, in the absence of um, a regional, let alone a global war, involving China and the United States, uh, that in fact, in the period uh, from the mid 2030s on, uh, China's um, uh, war, as it were, will be increasingly a domestic one between the demands of its national security establishment on the one hand, and the demands of retirement income and the health budget on the other. Um, uh, China has just entered into the realities that we, the rest of us all face, which is the competing demands of a domestic population requiring more and more government services against the external demands of its security apparatus, uh, given that they will probably come second to the internal demands of its security apparatus as well. Remember, China's internal security apparatus has more personnel in it than the People's Liberation Army. So, um, the full manifestation of China's um, date of the demographic destiny will not be with us probably until the mid thirties, 
Uh, the census data is an indication of where that's headed, but there's been an earlier indication as well in 2017 when the Chinese working age population or the Chinese workforce began to contract uh, in real terms as well. Hence increased Chinese um, labor costs, hence the offshoring of a number of Chinese uh, manufacturing uh, capabilities to first of all, proximate Southeast Asia and over time to a number of BRI countries as well. So I, I see therefore this is not being a, a mainstream major problem in terms of budget resources for the next 10 to 15 years. But by the time we get to, as it were, that period 2035 to 2050, you simply have to do the mathematics in order to conclude that it becomes a major constraint on the capabilities of the Chinese state at that point. Uh, barring, of course, some marvelous innovations in uh, technology, artificial intelligence and productivity, which offset um, the, um, the, the classical requirements for continued, um, as it were, inherent labor force uh, growth and productivity. Thank you, Kevin. Um, now I'd like to, to turn to questions and answers from the audience. So we already have a stream of questions in. And uh, could I, again, as I said at the start, remind everybody um, just when you pose the question, I'll, I'll obviously mediate uh, them to, to Kevin. Um, your, your identity and your affiliation and everything, of course, is on the record. Kevin, I have a question from Bill Emmett, who's the former editor of The Economist uh, and chair of the Japan Society of the UK and of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. And Bill says that US-led Western policy towards Taiwan has since the 1970s been one of strategic ambiguity. Recently, as in the US-Japan summit last month, the US has adopted some more overt positions, pulling allies along. How do you evaluate this and what do you see as the appropriate approach to Taiwan now? Well, my greetings to Bill, and, um, and I thank him for the question. Um, there's been a debate in the United States, which Bill will be familiar with, about the wisdom or otherwise of ma maintaining strategic ambiguity over Taiwan for the current um, US administration. Richard Haas, on behalf of the Council of Foreign Relations, has argued that the time for strategic ambiguity has come and gone, uh, and that it's time to harden up in terms of creating a more publicly recognizable red line on the part of the United States. Um, that's my paraphrase, the latter point. Um, people should read Richard's original comments. Um, I disagree with uh, Richard on this question. Uh, there is a wisdom in strategic ambiguity um, in the public domain, um, and that is uh, to cause, um, uh, in part, our Taiwanese friends uh, to know uh, that they cannot simply assume that the United States would ride in to protect Taiwan, irrespective of what the Taiwanese government did to provoke the Chinese at some point in the future, or for that matter, as we've seen in the past. Uh, I remember this in particular in the age of Chen Shui-bian, when he was uh, president of Taiwan, 2000-2008, I think, from memory, um, and uh, his predisposition to wake up each morning pick up um, his morning newspaper and work out how he could provoke the Chinese that afternoon. Um, and always on the border of, um, of um, the threshold uh, of, um, of um, some form of unilateral declaration of independence by Taiwan, which the Chinese um, Communist Party has always said would be a um, uh, a, um, an automatic red line for the initiation of military action against Taiwan. So the virtue of strategic ambiguity has not just been to send a message to Beijing, it's been to send a message to Taipei as well. Um, by the way, for those not familiar with uh, this arcane discussion about strategic ambiguity, uh, it means to cause the Chinese to be uh, ambiguous uh, about whether, sorry, for it to be ambiguous in China's eyes as to whether the United States would or would not intervene in defense of Taiwan under particular circumstances in the future. So I think the ambiguity holds in terms of uh, its relevance to Taiwan. We might think on the Taiwan question, for example, that under President Tsai Ing-wen, who has been a responsible leader of that country, 
uh, that uh, there's no prospect of China doing, uh, Taiwan doing anything unilateral. However, uh, her term expires in 2024, and with the Democratic Progress Party, the centre-left party in Taiwan, the technically the pro-independence party of Taiwan, we're never quite sure who's going to succeed her through the party primary process. So taking a long forward view, maintaining a policy, a declaratory policy of strategic ambiguity, I think is correct. Final point, uh, Declan, in response to Bill's question is having dispensed, if you like, with the, uh, the strategic ambiguity argument, what constitutes the best approach uh, for the rest of us in support of Taiwan in the future? I think it hang, hangs, hangs on three propositions. Number one, for the United States to maintain sufficient military capability itself to be able to effectively deter China from acting. And that means that the United States must have a very clear eyed view of the needs of Indo-Pacific Command uh, and uh, its ability to deploy out of Guam and out of Yokohama and elsewhere in order to cause the PLA to conclude that this would be too much a near run thing uh, to paraphrase um, uh, Wellington about Waterloo uh, to take the risk. Second, it depends on the also Taiwan's capacity and predisposition to have a national deterrent capability within the country itself. Taiwan is kept to a defense outlays of about 10%, 11% of budget for many, many years now. And there's a strong argument by many others that if Taiwan wishes to be effectively deterrent itself against the risk of a Chinese invasion in the future, it needs to do more to cause Beijing to conclude that any attempted military occupation of the island would be one of the bloodiest things that China has encountered since the Korean War and probably the war with Japan. Uh, and finally, for the rest of the international community, including countries like Australia and the Irish Republic, to make it very plain to our friends in Beijing that an, a coercive action against Taiwan to achieve Beijing's political aims of reunification would result in causing China to be politically and economically isolated in the world, uh, and that there would be a massive political foreign policy and international economic cost to be paid. They, I think, are the three essential deterrent elements in terms of Taiwan's future, uh, which we should be mindful of, rather than fiddling around with the doctrine of strategic ambiguity. Thanks, Kevin. I have a question from Podrick Murphy, who's the chair of the Institute's Foreign Policy Group and former ambassador of Ireland to Japan. And Podrick um, finds your presentation of China's foreign policy's vision as very persuasive, but he asked the question, does it go further and involve a view of China as the predominant power in the center with all others surrounding it more or less as tributaries, depending on their distance from the center. So um, that's, that's a question from Paldrick Murphy. Thank you, Paldrick. You, <laughs> you've been reading uh, the history of tributary states. Um, the tributary states history of China, particularly in the Ming and Qing dynasties is, um, is a fascinating read. And there are multiple different interpretations as to uh, the intensity of what it actually meant. Um, at different times in Chinese dynastic history. Um, there is certainly a view um, that at, at de minima, uh, it uh, was as follows, uh, that um, so long as neighboring states um, and proximate states provided um, annual tribute to the emperor, um, and uh, in fact received reciprocal tribute when they did so, um, and they then were authorized to engage in trade and commerce with the then celestial kingdom, uh, that basically Bob's your uncle is not a problem. Um, um, uh, secondly, um, on the adverse side uh, of the coin was a view that if uh, any of the tributary states failed uh, to um, provide um, tribute to the emperor, or undertook actions um, without the ultimate sanction of Beijing, uh, which were regarded as significant to Beijing at the time, um, uh, that um, under those circumstances, 
that the celestial kingdom reserved a right to then engage militarily against them. Um, and there are several instances of when this occurred, not always successfully, by the way, in the case of Annam, what subsequently became Vietnam. So there is a both a minimalist and a maximalist interpretation of what tributary state is a meant in dynastic times. Uh, the other point I'd make in response to the question is that we should not just assume that all of that has simply been translated into current uh, Chinese foreign policy, um, uh, as it were, worldview. I think it would be, however, a bit like this. China has a particular uh, priority attached to its um, neighboring states. Um, that has been historical from imperial times to the present and into the future. For the not unreasonable proposition that most of the invasions of China have occurred through its neighboring states, almost by definition, um, whether it's in the case of the Qing who themselves came from uh, Manchuria, or whether it was the Mongols who came obviously from Mongolia, uh, or various other invasions from various tribes to the North and West, uh, or uh, through their maritime neighbors in the case of Japan in the Second World War. Um, so therefore, there is a huge priority attached in China's foreign policy framework to what they call neighboring states. It's a separate category in itself. Ideally, what China wishes in those uh, neighboring states is to have them as compliant as possible to China's core national interests and its foreign policy interests. The extent to which it succeeds with all of its neighboring states is a separate question. Um, and I would simply make this as a side point. A huge strategic gain for the Chinese in terms of neighboring state strategy has been uh, the conversion of the Soviet Union and now Russia from being an adversary into being a de facto ally. Um, and given the enormous exposure of uh, China to Russia, the Russian Federation, through its contiguous land border, this has been an enormous factor uh, impacting on China's political consciousness. Final point is that in terms of, however, states beyond the neighboring states, um, as with any country, China sees the world in levels of concentric circles uh, of concern and opportunity. But I think its immediate strategic concerns are with its 14 neighboring states. Um, of course, the United States is seen as materially relevant to that, not because of its allied relationship with at least one of those states, namely, um, uh, well, ha almost one of those states in terms of the American military presence on the Korean Peninsula. And of course, it's allied relationship with two maritime neighbors being the Philippines and of course, um, Japan. Thanks, Kevin. I have a question from uh, retired Brigadier, Brigadier General Jera Hearn, who's a member of the Institute, who has been um, during his career deployed in Africa and has witnessed uh, China's Belt and Road policy quite closely and Chinese success in Africa in using its interests and values for partisan outcomes. Uh, he wants to know um, your view on why China has been so successful in pursuing its strategic interests in Africa. I think um, I thank the general for his question. Um, there is a long foundation to build on, as the general will be familiar. Um, back in the 1960s, even the late 50s, following the Bandung Conference, as Africa decolonized, the Chinese being um, a contender with India for leadership of the third world was already um, a uh, development as, uh, aid partner um, with uh, many uh, newly independent states uh, in, in Africa. In other words, there were strong foundations to build upon. But secondly, um, since the, um, not just with the Belt and Road Initiative, but prior to the Belt and Road Initiative, um, really going back to the time of Jiang Zemin in 2002, when he said to Chinese uh, business people, Zhou Chu, go out into the world. <laughs> and a bucket load of them did, and a bucket load of them ended up in Africa. And this was um, a good um, decade or so before Xi Jinping came up with the rubric, the Belt and Road Initiative. So it's both the experience of the 60s, the post-2002 experience, and now with the Belt and uh, Road Initiative, as I would call, turbocharge on top of it, 
Why have they succeeded? Historical continuity. Two, as you know, Chinese Marxist Leninist state, um, authoritarian state does not deliver any human rights lectures to any government anywhere about its domestic governance. It simply wishes to be there, have influence and to make money. I think the third reason is many states in which it has prevailed um, and been relatively successful in Africa have been infrastructure poor, private investment alternatives uh, from uh, elsewhere in the um, uh, let's call it the developed West, has not been sufficient to meet those infrastructure needs. Um, and many of the projects which have been desired have failed to either meet uh, World Bank or African Development Bank uh, development approval status standard, or the balance sheet of both those banks hasn't been sufficient to cover them. So I think it's an aggregation of these factors which has brought about, on balance, significant Chinese success, uh, not universal. There have been political reactions, government of Zambia and others, uh, Botswana, come to mind as cases in point. But if you were to produce the overall scorecard from Beijing's point of view, the great African initiative of the last 50 years, and particularly the last 10, on balance would be seen as a relatively strong success. Thanks, Kevin. I have a question from um, <clears throat> John Bruton, who's a former Taoiseach, former Prime Minister of Ireland. Uh, who would be interested to know what approach should the European Union take as between relations with the US and China? Well, I thank the former Tishik for uh, asking me such a delicate question. <laughs> and um, as a former prime minister myself, far be it for me to tell the current Tishik how he should balance his relations uh, with the United States and China. So let me just make a couple of um, broader observations. Um, and I'll reflect here on the Australian context, um, uh, given uh, there may be some similarity in the principles which are involved, though not all of them. Um, uh, the first is this, in my own dealings as Prime Minister with the um, uh, Chinese leaders, both uh, Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping, I was always plain about the fact in my discussions with him that we are a Western democracy anchored in liberal democratic values, which will never change. That is a question of who we are, that is our identity. And as a consequence, we also believe in universal human rights, anchored in the Universal Declaration of 1948 and the UN Covenant of Civil Political uh, Rights uh, of uh, the 1960s. China is a signatory to both and a ratification state for the first, if not the second. And as a consequence, um, I would explain to Chinese leaders, when we engage with you on human rights uh, questions, we will do so within the fabric of the international legal norms you have subscribed to, uh, rather than simply the assertion unilaterally of the norms uh, which um, we may have in mind from time to time. So, and I always said to him, this will create frictions from time to time. Uh, when I gave a speech as prime minister at uh, Beijing University, um, um, I delivered the speech in Chinese and at that time um, said that there are significant human rights abuses in Tibet. This was not popular in Beijing, particularly on a prime ministerial visit, um, but it was necessary to say. The second principle, I think, which is important in the case of Australia, less not in the case of the Irish Republic, which is not a treaty ally of the United States, unless something has happened I'm unaware of, but uh, maybe you think the Bostonian connection is sufficient uh, uh, for treaty purposes anyway, I'm not sure. But uh, um, but in Australia, we have this thing called ANZUS, which is a formal security treaty with the Americans going back to 1951. Um, and having been um, allies with the Americans in both the First World War and the Second World War and throughout the Pacific War. Uh, this goes deep in Australia. So my response uh, always to the Chinese was, and we're an ally of the United States, um, not least because of our historical experience, and that's not going to change either. And therefore, that will, from time to time, produce frictions. Thirdly, we do, however, as an Australian government, wish to maximise our trade, investment, education, and technology relationship with you uh, bilaterally to our mutual advantage. And we should embrace all measures and means of policy to do so, uh, including, in our case, the early negotiation of a free trade agreement. Fourthly, I also said... Uh, we're active members of the international community, not just through the United Nations, in our case also through the multilateral institutions of Asia, 
um, APEC and the rest, but also both members of the G20. I said, and therefore on questions of global economic governance, we wish to work strongly with you, as we did during the global financial crisis, intimately with the Chinese government and designing a package there. And the fifth principle, which I didn't quite articulate to my Chinese interlocutors at the time was this, <clears throat> if you're going to have a disagreement with Beijing uh, on something which is necessary and fundamental, then do two things. Uh, one, bring as many other countries along with you as possible in the articulation of that disagreement. Um, and that is uh, come with your own friends, partners and allies. Um, and secondly, uh, be um, judicious in your public language. Uh, uh, not to say you censor your public language, but you be judicious in it and use um, um, public diplomacy when absolutely necessary but maximize the utility of private diplomacy in securing the objectives which you seek. So for me, these have been the overarching principles for how to manage a reasonable relationship with Beijing, given the differences between democracies like Ireland and Australia, friends of the United States in our case allies, and dealing with um, the Chinese economic and opportunity and the global governance necessity. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just saying that I, I take your point about allies, but uh, many years ago when I was dealing with um, EU foreign policy and relations with the US, uh, the US used to refer to as an ally, but they used to use a small A rather than the big A, <laughs> the capital A. So uh, we were quite happy with that. We, That's good. <laughs> we were happy to be, to be so described. Um, I have a question from Gabriel Dennison, who is uh, the CEO of the Irish Academy of Engineering who thanks you for your presentation and also notes that the West seems powerless to influence Chinese policy and human rights, most notably towards the Uyghurs. Is there anything that liberal economies can do to pressure or encourage China to moderate its approach in this respect? Or is this something on which for a variety of reasons, China will continue simply to pursue its own path? Absent fundamental political change in the Chinese system, that is the fundamental reform of the Communist Party and or its decision to transition to a different form of governance, which frankly was a debate being held within China back in the 1980s, but not since the 80s. Um, it is difficult to see fundamental change in relation to uh, Chinese approaches to both Xinjiang in one direction, and let's just say Hong Kong and Tibet in other directions. Secondly, um, the Xinjiang factor is also in China's mind driven by questions of not just national unity, but national security as well. Um, there were um, terrorist acts uh, by various Xinjiang organizations against Han Chinese, most notably in Kunming, uh, when 30 or 40 people were killed at, at a railway station. Uh, were killed at a railway station through a bombing and also uh, self-immolation in front of um, uh, Tiananmen, uh, the gate of heavenly peace in Beijing. Um, so that's the prism through which they uh, view this. Tibet um, for different reasons, Hong Kong for different reasons, but all to do with questions of national unity and in their view, national, that's national security. My own view, um, is consistent with what I just said before about the management of human rights disagreements with China, uh, is that we as Western democracies and as democracies writ large, whether we're from the West or not, uh, is to constantly return to the international instruments, the Universal Declaration, the, uh, uh, the uh, International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, and the institution designed for the prosecution of those instruments, namely the Human Rights Council in Geneva, and of course, the UN itself in New York. Now, these are the instruments of international law and global governance. And I know for a fact that our friends in Beijing are deeply concerned when these instruments are deployed in a manner uh, which uh, challenges the legitimacy of their actions. Um, if you want to have a case study of that in a different domain, look at China's reaction to the um, uh, determination by the 
uh, Tribunal of UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, in the Philippines case brought against China over the Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea. And there's a reason why China is uncomfortable with this because it brings into challenge China's global standing and reputation, which in Chinese culture and tradition, quite apart from Communist Party legitimacy terms, means something, means a lot. Does it, or can you establish a direct causality, however, between a concerted set of such actions on the one hand and a, any fundamental change in a uh, observable time frame to human rights practices, say in Xinjiang or Hong Kong or Tibet, that would be stretching it in terms of where the evidence stands. Um, but I would simply say, however, that as democracies ourselves who adhere to these international covenants as a matter of international law, that it's incumbent on those of us uh, who are committed to these principles to continue to argue them irrespective of whether we see a material change on the ground or not. We cannot afford for um, resistance to those um, principles, to those covenants, to those conventions as being a recipe to, as it were, incrementally abandon the legitimacy of those covenants over time. Uh, because uh, that would be, I think, a perilous journey for all of us who see ourselves as supporters of liberal democratic order for the long term. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just you, you, you gave a very interesting answer there. And if I could just um, just slightly develop Gabriel's question and go back to something you said earlier as well. There is, I suppose, at the moment, a kind of tussle for the title deeds of multilateralism going on between um, what we in Ireland and the European Union uh, and the US and Australia call the rules-based international order. Um, and China doesn't like that term rules-based international order, which it tends to see as kind of in its language cliques and hegemony. Um, and you also have uh, a kind of um, strict constructionist view the Chinese set out about the UN Charter a very conservative view, particularly around the question of non-interference. And I was struck even last month, uh, Xi Jinping at the Boao Economic Summit uh, invoked, you referred to it earlier yourself, the five principles of peaceful coexistence as a continuing principle of Chinese foreign policy, namely non-interference in internal affairs, which runs counter to the kind of approach uh, that we have on human rights. Where do you see this struggle for the title deeds going? And what role should the Security Council play in this? I ask that because Ireland at the moment is a non-permanent member. Yeah, I'm very pleased to have seen uh, Ireland elected to the um, Security Council. Uh, when I was Prime Minister, we um, ran a successful ballot ourselves to be non-permanent members. So being... Um, uh, a non-permanent member of the Security Council carries with it particular responsibilities, um, uh, obligations and opportunities, because all the questions, frankly, of global governance and uh, those facing the international community suddenly become directly relevant to um, the day-to-day -day deliberations of the Irish Foreign Ministry. Um, suddenly, we in Australia had to become experts in Sierra Leone. Um, and uh, and uh, therefore I understand uh, the basis of the question coming uh, from your own membership of the Security Council. And Declan, as you know, as a professional diplomat um, yourself, uh, the United Nations Charter is an interesting beast. Um, and if you read it carefully, that's this, and as it was designed by a committee, um, it, uh, it was a pretty interesting committee that put it together. Um, and, um, I, don't, I doubt that the Charter could ever have been agreed at any time since 1945, by the way, um, because uh, it was such a complex negotiation then. But you're right, it does assert the sovereignty of states, but it also asserts um, uh, other principles of, um, of international governance, uh, which do not provide carte blanche to sovereign states uh, to um, act against their domestic populations in any manner that they so choose, particularly with the evolution through the United Nations system, uh, particularly uh, in the period since uh, Srebrenica and since Rwanda uh, of international humanitarian intervention. 
Um, and as a consequence, uh, there are live doctrines uh, around the responsibility to protect, uh, which are still alive in international law, and um, which have been that way for the last 20 or 25 years. And of course, that underpins many of the discussions at present in the UN community about what to do about uh, the situation now in Myanmar. So therefore, yes, the Chinese are right about uh, mutual non-interference. It does come out of not just the non-aligned movement, but it is an active um, uh, principle uh, that has its foundations in the UN Charter, but it is not unqualified. Um, and the qualifications have been subsequently evolved uh, through um, international practice, experience, the horrors of Srebrenica and Rwanda, and the decisions that we reached as a community of nations since then. Uh, on, the, um, on the future, um, in uh, dealing with this complex interplay of um, sovereignty uh, and human rights, again, I simply go back to the principle that uh, we cannot, under any circumstances, act in a manner which undermines uh, the integrity of the, um, of the Charter, the Universal Declaration of 48, and the International Covenant. These provide, as it were, the ultimate heads of power for the, not just the um, ideological legitimacy, but the political legitimacy uh, of our demands in the international community that all states so oblige. And we cannot, under any circumstances, incrementally begin to walk away from them, however frustrating it may appear to be in any particular application of these principles to a crisis of the time. The worst thing that can happen is that we end up um, devoid of such principles um, and ultimately are left with only one, which is the invasion of one state against another as being the only um, matter upon which uh, the community of other states could act in concert uh, to uh, sustain the common peace. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm afraid the, the clock has, has caught up with us. You have been extraordinarily generous with your time. And this has been a tremendously informative and illuminating uh, session. And I want on behalf of the IIEA and I think everybody who tuned in to thank you for this really superb presentation uh, that you've given. Um, I also, let me apologize to some, there were many questions, I couldn't get to them all, but um, I think that we heard from Kevin an extremely uh, authoritative, impressive uh, um, setting out of the, the issues around the geopolitical uh, rise of China. So it just falls to me, Kevin, to thank you very much indeed for your time and for engaging with us on this uh, and to wish you all the very best and we hope that we can uh, stay in touch with you and uh, let me also just I was in Beijing when you gave that speech to Beida in April 2008 in Chinese and it was a tour de force uh, so uh, let me congratulate you on that now uh, even after all those years uh, but once again thanks and uh, with that uh, we've come to the end of our webinar and uh, thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, Declan. And uh, greetings to everybody in the Irish Republic.